very warm welcome. My name is David Roth and I'm the CEO of The Store, WPP, and Chairman of BAV. And it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to Follow the Sun, 24 hours of broadcasting right across the world, to celebrate the launch of the WPP BAV Best Countries Study for 2022, produced in conjunction with the US News and Wharton Business School. It's a pleasure to have you join us for this session. This broadcast is going to travel right across the world, starting in New Zealand and ending 24 hours later in the USA. We have an absolutely packed broadcast today. This year's Best Country Study is our fullest and most comprehensive yet. The attitudes of global business leaders, opinion formers and citizens towards nation strength has changed dramatically in recent years, never more so than in 2022. And we'll be looking at how those changes in values have impacted overall perceptions of our 85 nations covered in the 2022 study. But perceptions of a country only tell half the story. We'll then visit 24 countries to hear what's happening from WPP experts on the ground and sometimes how perceptions of a country don't really reflect the situation. Now, our time together promises to be informative, challenging, stimulating and, I hope, fun. So, let's get started. How a country is viewed around the world is of huge importance politically, economically and socially, it has the ability to contribute to both a nation's hard and soft power. The Romans understood this well. SPQR, an abbreviation for Centanus Populosque Romanus, was arguably the first country branding. It was an emblematic, abbreviated phrase referring to the government of the ancient Roman Republic. You only needed to see the emblem, and invaded countries knew exactly what was in store for them. So country branding itself is not new, but measuring it is. Now in our seventh year, the WPP BAV Annual Best Countries Rankings measures global perceptions of countries against a series of characteristics. Impressions that have the potential to drive trade, travel and investment. They also directly affect brands. The study was developed by WPP BAV, the Wharton Business School of the University of Pennsylvania and US News. The ranking is based on a large global survey which asks a range of people about how they perceive different countries against a range of key attributes. Country branding also has a significant impact on corporate and product brands. The words made in can instantly lend credibility and trust to a product or brand that a consumer hasn't previously encountered. That could be enough to convince someone to buy and beyond that, convince them to pay a premium. Likewise, made in can prove an instant turnoff if a consumer associates the country of origin with poor safety standards or sees it as being behind the times on social issues or workers' rights. But it's not just a one-way reaction. The perceptions and performance of brands abroad feedback into the development of the country itself. Additionally, willingness for corporates to invest vital FDI is also closely linked to the strength of a country's brand. As local brands and businesses succeed, they generate economic growth as well as lending further positive associations to their country's brand. There's a close relationship between how people feel about a country and their attitudes towards the brand they associate with that country. Strong countries fuel strong brands and vice versa. Think of France and Chanel. Both represent elegance, glamour and prestige. Chanel is intrinsically French and France is synonymous with Chanel. 
The same can be said of Italy and Ferrari, or Japan and Sony. In each case, brands and the countries are part of a virtuous circle. A symbiotic relationship, in fact, Germany, is a really fine example of this symbiosis in action. Germany has come to represent the qualities of durability and engineering that brands like Bosch, BMW, Audi and Mercedes have shown the world that Germany can deliver. Brands can both shape and be shaped by the perceptions of their country of origins. Japan in the 1970s was known as a cheap manufacturing base, but now respected as a world leader for quality electronics and also technology, thanks largely to brands like Sony and Toyota. South Korea has taken a similar path, with Samsung and Hyundai demonstrating to the entire world what modern South Korea is and is doing. So creating consumer predisposition in international markets that favor other South Korean brands. There's a two-way reaction and a multiplier effect for both. This year's study quantifies the impact. We see that 83% of consumers globally agree that consumer brands play an important role in defining a country's culture. 78% also agree that the country a product is made in impacts my preference to purchase it. Our annual Best Countries ranking was first launched in 2016 at the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, the world's largest gathering of global leaders and heads of industry and influence. It's now in its seventh year, and given how turbulent the past seven years have been across the globe, enables us to see the impact of the changes. The Best Country Ranking incorporates the views of close to 18,000 individual members of the public and business decision makers, surveyed in 85 countries across the world. This year's survey was completed in mid-2022. Collectively, the 85 countries in the 2022 rankings account for about 95% of global gross domestic product per capita and represent 80% of the world's population. Individuals surveyed for best countries were asked how closely they associated 73 attributes with a range of countries. These attributes were then grouped into 10 categories that were used to calculate the best countries ranking and more on those attributes later. So come with me as we meet our first guests on our interview stage. Well, I'm very delighted now to be joined by Lord Jim O'Neill, the former chief economist of Goldman Sachs and uh, a former government uh, UK minister and chairman of Chatham House. Jim, Lord O'Neill, thank you very much indeed for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Um, President Zelensky has said that the price we have to pay for avoiding a third world war is going to be higher energy bills, you know, increase in the cost of living uh, and a reduction in living standards. And this comes at a time where we see from our BAV best country study that softer values sort of like you know, quality of life and social purpose are much more important in defining a nation's brand. But, but do you think mm -hmm. that public opinion at the moment will pressurize governments uh, to hold their current policies? Uh, or do you think uh, they will start to look at alternatives? Nice, easy question that you start with. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know, um, because it is probably for my generation, never mind the younger generation, uh, the first such uh, issue of this scale and complexity that we've seen. Um, so far, it appears um, Western nations, who are the prime uh, supporters of Ukraine, of course, uh, have been happy to support the, the government's stance on Ukraine. 
and superficially um, accept the cost, uh, which is essentially this enormous cost of living shock. Um, but it remains to be seen how that passes the test of time. So uh, as we're seeing here, the government itself is almost definitely going to have to pay for the cost uh, of this dilemma. Uh, I can't help finishing my answer to this very tricky question by also pointing out that if we really want to be serious uh, about climate change and alternative energies, uh, having a permanently higher price for carbon emitting uh, energy forms is probably ultimately the sort of thing that is needed. Uh, one would imagine accelerate the desire for alternative energies to become more and more part of everyday life. Now, um, you were chairman of the Chatham House, one of the world's uh, leading think tanks. Its mission of a world that is sustainable, secure and prosperous is great. What do you feel, how far are we from, from uh, realising uh, that goal? Isn't and hasn't really worked the way it's supposed to do on the tin. So, so, so Jim, uh, what, what should the priorities of nations be then now? Yeah, so to, to, what should we do about it? You know, I, I, I've become linked to a number of things I've been involved in, a, a big believer in what I broadly call profit with purpose. And, and we need to have uh, business itself think more about uh, the societal remit of who ultimately they serve. We've lived in an era and still do of where the only thing that matters for many public, certainly publicly quoted business is the shareholder. And it's not enough. And private business shouldn't be rewarded if we don't have productivity that goes with these big gains for them. Uh, and policymakers need to be more alert to the realities of life rather than just what was in economic textbooks of the 1960s and 70s. And uh, if we don't learn from that, I have a fear that some of the dilemmas that have just blown up dramatically in the past few years out of nowhere could actually get worse. Now, we started with a hard question, so let's end with an easy one. Uh, Lord Henry, are you an optimist or a pessimist given uh, the situation we see around the world today? Uh, right now, I, I feel a lot more pessimistic than I've done for a long time. And I, However, that said, uh, you know, I've been around uh, the policy di 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 area in many different forms for over 40 years, and I've lived through a lot of crises. And the one thing I know for sure is that the crisis you're in, even though it often seems the worst you've ever been through, they come to an end. And one of the big things I've learned is never let a crisis go to waste. And indeed, the making of uh, a business, a leader, or of a country is how they respond to the crisis you are in, because it normally defines how you're going to deal with the future uh, era. So in that sense, there are, there are lots of ways of, of things that could emerge from all of this mess in a more positive way. Well, Lord Jim and Neil, um, ending uh, on a slightly more positive note than we uh, started. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's been a, a privilege uh, uh, to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thanks for having me joining you. As we travel around the world together in our Follow the Sun broadcast, we'll be hearing news, views and insights from local WPP company colleagues in 24 of the 85 countries covered in the WPP BAV Best Country Study for 2022. Now, before we go to one of those countries, let's remind ourselves of the WPP BAV Best Countries 2022 rankings from the 85th down to the number one country.
Let's see what the overall findings of Best Countries 2022 are before we go to the USA for local insights from the WPP team there. And don't forget to download the Best Countries Metaverse Experience for even more global insights from the address on your screen. Historically, military power and finance, banks and tanks were the attributes against which we measured a country's power in the world. Not anymore. So what does all this mean? It shows that a nation focused on providing great quality of life for its people, which cares about the rights and equality, and has a focus on entrepreneurship, is seen as having the most powerful nation brand. This reflects a world today and the factors that influence public perceptions and consumer decision-making, and by implication, a nation's political policy-making. So let's take a look at those 10 factors and their weights for 2022. Entrepreneurship, 14.2%. Cultural influence, 10.4%. Power, 5%. Heritage, 3.1%. Adventure, 5.5%. Quality of life, 14.5%. Open for business, 9.3%. Social purpose, 13.5%. Agility, 14%. Movers, 10.6%. So, it's clearly no longer just tanks and banks that give a country influence around the world. Softer power, which comes about as a result of entrepreneurship and cultural exports, is increasingly making an impact. Hi, I'm Michael Sussman. Um, I'm the Chief Product Officer of BAB WPP. And today I'm going to talk about Brand America and Made in America. What does it mean to our consumer brands? Um, just excited to talk about the launch of Best Countries, and that's what this event's about. You know, and we've, does, we've done this in multiples of countries and, and Brand USA, I'm here to talk about today. And we did this amazing study with US News and, and WPP and, of course, BAB and, and our friends at Warden. Um, University, um, and this is our seventh year of measuring countries as brands, and excited to share some some cool new things. Um, so, for the agenda for today is first of all the power of brand America, and that's why we're here. Um, second is um, what does made in America mean, and how does it influence your brands? And there's a lot of brands that are leaning into it. Weather tech, like made in America, that means something to us. What does that mean to the rest of the world? And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about superheroes and rock and roll because they're brands too. And what can we learn, and how does that relate to brand America? Um, so I have a lot of data to play with and talk about. I'm going to use both BAV and look at American brands and our best country study that we just launched. Again, so much rich data that can really help us understand these dynamics. Um, this past best country study, we went out there, we measured 85 countries uh, around the world. And, um, and so when I talk about how our country does, it's versus these 85 brands. And we, flecked, you know, we measured the, the biggest J GDP um, per capita nations, um, representing almost 80% of the world population. So pretty good coverage of, of nations. We didn't get everyone, but we got a bulk. Um, so how did USA do? Okay, I should have worn my brand USA shirt. Um, we're, we're number four, and this is the first time we've been at number four in, I think it's been five years. We, you know, so I think we slipped a little bit and we came back and ranking number four behind Switzerland, um, Germany, Canada, and USA. And we'll talk about that because some of this is a little bit surprising. Canada ahead of us. Again, it depends on how you define power. How do you just define strength of a nation? And what we do is look at what are those things that are important to a GDP and we model it analytically. And, and so let's talk about some of those things. So overall, we rank number four, but you could see there's a little bit of a bimodal situation going on here. So in Japan, South Korea, UK, Chile, Mexico, France, Saudi, India, we're in the top 10 out of 85. 
We slip to the second tier in some other countries, Argentina, Germany, Turkey, and so on. China sees us as number 12. Still pretty strong globally, but you can see there's two levels and everybody else is somewhere in between. So again, we're pretty consistently strong, which is what drives our number four, but we're not perfect and some nations don't see us as strong as others. Um, when we think about this, the strength of a nation, we talk about these 10 dimensions that have been analytically proven working with our partners at Warden and US News and a lot of the BAV folks on my team. Um, to, to, to quantify the power, the impact of these dimensions. So there's power, the strength of a nation, traditional, what you think of a strong country. There's agility, something that's becoming more important today than ever. Um, cultural influence, and you can see that some nations have lots of cultural influence, and of course, Brand USA does. Entrepreneurship, heritage, purposefulness has become much more important today, social purpose. Quality of life, another important um, dimension. Being a mover and a shaker, you know, dynamic, you know, Wall Street, making it happen, um, mover dimension, adventure is another dimension, which, uh, and then finally open for business, the ease of doing business with a nation. So you can start to see the importance of these things. And and what we've noticed over the, the past years is that soft power has become more important to the su success of a nation, quality of life, entrepreneurship, agility, purpose, you know, things like power, traditional banks and tanks are actually becoming less important today to what makes a country attractive globally uh, and financially. Um, so interesting shifts over time. And you can see why some of the brands that are ahead of us um, did well, they do well in some of these softer powers. Um, soft, you know, soft powers are becoming more important today. Um, where classic power has fallen from, from, you know, down to 10th place, ninth place, I'm sorry, out of 10 dimensions in terms of the impact. So just being a brand, a company with a company, just being a um, nation with, with, with armies and money and muscle doesn't make you a powerful nation. Um, it's an interesting thing to think about. It's changed. The dynamics have changed. The rise of social purpose has become much more important. Um, it moved from fifth up to fourth place this year in one year. Um, and so the importance of being a purposeful and a caring nation has is, is become more important than ever to the rest of the world. So um, something we should continue to think about. So how do we do? We do really well on traditional power, banks and tanks. Yeah, not surprising. Um, that's why we're not number one, because that's not a number one driver. Um, we're not as much of a mover as we used to be. We're still entrepreneurial. Lots of cultural influence, number three. Agility, number one, right? Purposeful, 18, could be better. It's a little disappointing. Um, you could see places where we're strong and places where we're weak, but overall, we're pretty strong. I'll tell you where we really are strong. Um, we're strong on the, on the consumer products and brands we make, so this is really relevant to us as marketers. Um, we rank number one out of 85 um, countries that has strong consumer brands, um, seen as modern, seen as a leader, connected, entrepreneurial, politically influential. Um, International alliances, easy to get, you know, work with with money and so on. But again, that I want to talk more about that has strong consumer brands because we're in the branding business. What does that mean? Um, so I'll get to that in a moment. Um, you know, just looking at what we're strong in power. Yes, we're seen as a leader, strong international alliances, strong military. So it's not part of our strength. Agility, though, we're adaptable, responsive, modern, progressive, dynamic, amazing traits, important to brands as we see in BAB and now important to nations. Um, Again, strong cultural influence, influence, strong consumer brands, as I said, fashionable, modern, um, culturally significant entertainment, trendy. Um, so again, you can see how Hollywood in, in, has impacted us as a nation. Um, you know, even countries that um, don't see us as number, they, that second tier that sees us in the top 10, I mean, 15, 11 to 20 um, ranking, um, they still see us as culturally influential, no matter who you are. The world sees that the USA is culturally influential, usually in the top five. So here are just some examples. Even in um, China, they, they give us third place there. Um, what we do know is where brands come from matter to the world. 78% agree that a country a product is made impacts my preference to purchase it. So a nationality made in America means something if, if America is a strong brand. And we know it's strong on consumer goods. In fact, 80% of Americans um, say that where a product is made matters to me, where a country is made affects my preference. Brand USA means a hell of a lot to us. And when you start to dissect where our strengths are in terms of made in America, um, you can see that we're pretty good. We're number two on automobiles behind Germany and a little bit ahead of, 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 of um, Japan. Number two on beer, rock on, right? Um, clothing and apparel, number two. We beat out Italy, Italy in terms of fashion. That's pretty fun. Um, financial services, number one. Cosmetics, number two. Um, packaged foods, number three behind Germany and France, who'd have guessed? Um, spirits, number three um, behind Germany and France, that makes sense. I was surprised Germany was number one, but um, nothing like a good shot of Jägermeister. Um, 
technology, we're number one, um, Apple, no surprise, Tesla, no surprise, pharmaceuticals, number two behind Germany, um, and healthcare, number five, we didn't make it to the top three, but pretty good. Um, so you can see our strength in these sectors and the products that come out of these sectors are powerful because people give credit for American te technology and, and there's value to, or, or cosmetics or fashion. Um, here are some of the most influential brands that transcend their categories and culture in the USA. These are brands that make a difference, that mean something to Americans, that mean something to, you know, some of them to the rest of the world. From Tide to Apple to Google to Coca-Cola to Doritos and Starbucks. Patagonia, again, shout out to Patagonia. Um, it's amazing what our brands stand for and represent and how they do reflect who we are as a nation and how the world sees them as part of America. Um, if you think about BAV, and I won't get into BAV right now, but just trust me, Upper Right is, is strong versus all other brands and culture. Um, you know, these brands that, that are influential are among the strongest in culture. And there's not much brands that, that are much stronger than Google and, and, and Amazon and, and Coca-Cola in terms of cultural icons, in terms of equity. Um, so they make a difference. Brands that come from America make a difference. And in fact, they in some ways transcend our borders. We know that Apple is everywhere, 1 billion users for, of 1.4 billion products. And, the most visited store is, is not in the US, it's in Shanghai. Again, the, the power of American brands to influence transcends borders. So our brands are powerful because of they represent who we are. And, and, and we know that brands are responsible for more than just selling products. For, um, it might be stopping selling in a, in a hostile nation. It might be um, giving your company to, to cl climate change. It might be for a chicken brand like KFC to sell not beyond meat. Again, all these brands are influencing and changing the way we do things and think and, and act and behave and their responsibilities have shifted and brands need to think bigger. Um, brands can transcend, not an American brand, but an amazing brand. Lego transcends toys. It's it's art, it's movies, it's entertainment, it's partnerships. Um, and in my mind, even though at and is probably worth a lot more financially, um, Lego might be much more influential in culture. It's more loved. It's more different. It's more again. So you can see the power of brand beyond just the balance sheets. Um, we know that influential brands are more than twice as much likely to be used, or 2.3 times more preferred, and they have greater ac av advocacy. Brands that have an influence on how I engage with with life um, are stronger brands, and we can measure that. Um, they're seen as leaders. They're more likely to be loved and have greater pricing power. So you think about the American brands that are creating passion and influence in culture, they're outstanding. They represent Brand America and Brand America is tied to them and their industry, I can't even say it, they're, they're highly linked um, and they give you financial returns. So influential brands, brands that come from America and represent, um, they outperform, outperform the marketplace over five years by about 2.7 times versus the S&P. The most influential American brands um, outpace the S&P the top 20% by almost double, but you get to the top most influential brands, brands that stand for something that moves categories and transcends categories and represents America, um, they outperform the S&P 500 by about 5.3 times over a five-year period, quite impressive. Um, again, you gotta think about our American brands and how they influence the world and how America influences them. Um, we can look at the ways brands influence in America and around the world. And you can see there are lots of ways brands can be influential through purposefulness, through innovation, through trust, through convenience. Again, lots of great examples. I'll show you a few of them. Here's some in the USA. Now you think about the most influential brands that made in America mean something. Um, the most trusted brands in America, I was love the fact that it's a national weather service, which I guess they're 90% accurate, but with it, give or take some significance levels, I'm sure. Um, UPS, you know, and, and Home Depot. So interesting, multiple categories. These are among the most trusted brands in America today. And they all stand for something. They all have powerful reach and they have powerful impact. Um, if you look at the national weather service on the BAV, on our power grid, sorry, it's a little um, messy up there on the upper right. You can see that the National Weather Service is stronger than our TV networks. It's stronger than, you know, the, the, you know, the Crown and 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 I'm looking at some random YouTube TV. That's pretty impressive. Ahead of the Voice, ahead of SNL, the weather, the weather National Weather Station. That's trust. That's influence and culture. Um, it sits there with brands like Amazon. Pretty impressive. Um, we know purposefulness is gaining ground. We've seen this over the years in BAB. It continues to, it continues to. Um, grow in importance, being purposeful and being influential in America today, particularly among younger consumers. So here are some of the most purposeful brands in America today. Um, the Honest Company um, with Jessica Alba, I think, again, really interesting product. Um, Trader Joe's, um, 
one of my favorites to talk about this category and they took a chore and they made it fun but they did more than that they the focus on making the world better their healthy products and and they eliminate waste and they eliminated one million pounds of plastic waste from their products in their stores which is thinking about packaging thinking about bigger picture things um again amazing brands disrupt categories in america today um bombas another great example it was on shark tank they donate socks and they were one of the pioneers in that um get buy a pair get a pair and it's really making a difference um Again, looking at Trader Joe's, it's a supermarket brand with store brand only products, and they completely disrupt the rest of the supermarket categories. And again, they're sitting up there with brands like Apple in terms of equity, a supermarket brand, three times the differentiation, one and a half times more loved. You can see the power of being an influential brand in America today. When we think about the most innovative brands in America, these are fun ones, and these are brands we all are interested in. Um, Tesla, again, great example of a brand. Um, that really owns the, the um, innovation in, in American culture today. Google, one of our WPP clients, is an amazing brand that really, again, is in the top of all brands and culture in the USA on influence. And then NASA, of course, you know, the space race and all that, how it's, it's really interesting how it's becoming commercialized a bit and how they're collaborating, but that's another great brand that's reinvigorating itself and really leading into innovation. Um, you know, you can see how brands that own influence in America today through innovation are really just changing the landscape of how we communicate, how we listen, how we talk, how we share, um, even how we heat our homes and, and, and fuel our engines. So now you're seeing pop up charging stations. I mean, they're changing the landscape physically and emotionally. These brands have influence. These brands are powerful brands in America and around the world. Um, luxury. Luxury is a cool one. I mean, again, these are American brands that stand out globally and they define luxury around the world today we're not the only ones but there are some great examples of them um tiffany's is ranks in the top one percent most prestigious brands around the world glamorous upper class prestigious pretty impressive that's american luxury um some you know cool facts about influence um charles lewis tiffany designed the first ever engagement ring in 19 i mean sorry 1886 i did not know that um they registered the color. That's cool to own a color. And that makes sense. And of course, even Hollywood's leaned into Tiffany's. I mean, there's a powerful brand that transcends culture um, um, around the world. Of course, talking speaking of Hollywood, we're, we do a lot in that space in America today. These are some of the most contemporary brands around the world. Apple, which is entertainment, it's electronics, it's a lot of different things. It clearly transcends. YouTube, um, that's one of the top, it's the number two search engine behind Google. Um, it's also an entertainment thing. You know, I know that people watch and consume um, through it, um, entertainment and content. Stitch Fix, again, another brand that's using data science to transcend ca traditional categories. Um, again, YouTube is TV. I am a YouTube TV user. I cut my cord, right? Life goes on and you learn and you, you see that the world looks different when, when you when you play, when you look at these some of the more innovative influencers and contemporary influencers. And um, YouTube is a 2.5 billion active users. That's pretty impressive if I'm one of them. Um, Stitch Fix, I mean, I think that the, the fact that they're impacting and changing the landscape of department stores and, and businesses is, is quite impressive and, and scary at the same time. So you have to look at the brands that have influence in American culture today. Um, convenience, let's not forget about that. America is the king of convenience or queen um, of convenience. And here are some of our most convenient. Walmart, because you can get everything there and it's about saving money, that's convenient. Mac and cheese, we all know why that's there. I think um, I just learned that mac and cheese came from France and it used to be a prestigious meal for the kings and queens. Um, and it became convenience in America today. I think that's a great example. And uh, McDonald's, come on. Um, they define convenience and they not only define it here, they define convenience around the world. But clearly they represent convenience in the American culture today. And these are some of the strongest. Um, you know, the fact that McDonald's invented the combo meal in 1958. Um, you know, that changed the world, that created influence, and that's American influence, and we love McDonald's in America today. Um, just one more section. I want to talk a little bit about rock and roll and, and superheroes. So um, some brands stand for more than one path to influence, right? Some brands are about purpose and performance, right? Nike, Disney, they, they lean into two poles, and, and that's an exciting place for brands to create influence because it could be more than one thing. Um, I call that brand tensity. It's like we find that tension within a brand, and great brands have that tension um superheroes great superheroes marble superheroes have that kind of tension you look at any of these characters or you look at um iron man reckless wisdom you look at captain america he's humble but also the super soldier every one of the characters in marvel or have that dichotomy that tension that makes them so interesting and we need to think about that in the, the great brands and we see that in great american brands um 
great American talent like Marilyn Monroe still doing advertising today. She was seductive, but also a bit innocent at the same time. And that tension made her, you know, stand the test of time. Um, the Beatles, one of my faves, um, John and Paul could not have been more distinct. John was jagged emotion. Paul was giddy romanticism. John was stripped down homage to rock and roll. Paul with melodies and lyrics that were fun and harmonic. Um, John was impatient and, and Paul was optimistic. Um, as one of his producers, I think producers, Bob Spitz said, um, they, they were so different, but they when they came together and merged, they became the Beatles sound. And that that's tension. We try to find that tension and we see that in the most strong American brands. It's a great partnership that leaned into that tension. You know, um, Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett, they couldn't be more at odds, but together they were what H&M wanted to stand for, something that's exciting. Um, great brands have it. Nike, as I said, every man empowerment. There's a nice tension there. Just do it says it all. Target, which is about value and style, cheap, chic, that don't belong together. Together, democratization of design. Another great American brand. A third great American brand, um, Harley Davidson. It's about brotherhood and rebellion. But, you know, when you bring those two together, that doesn't make sense. Like, you know, against, but together. Um, United by Independence was their tagline that leaned into that. So you can see how tension works. Um, I'll talk about a brand that's influencing everybody, and then that's Netflix. It's about limit, limitless, and it's also about accessible, right? It gives you everything and so much. Um, and look at where it is around the world today, Netflix. That's an American brand creating cultural influence around the rest of the world. Um, but what's also interesting is, so part of it is what we, the programming, so strange, um, Stranger Things, that's pushing out American 80s culture to the rest of the world. At the same time, the Squid Games is bringing in um, South Korean um, culture to America. So Netflix is a conduit for for influencing around the world and making an impact. So quite fascinating. Um, these brands that I talk about really matter. So just some key takeaways. Number one, brand influence really matters among Americans, right? These are the most influential brands in America. And these brands stand out from their categories and create deeper passion and deeper advocacy. So find your influence, number one. Number two, influence comes in all shapes and sizes. It's about finding your innate path to being influential. When you find it, you're going to drive greater usage, greater preference, greater recommendation, and greater pricing power. All the things that we try to do as branding experts. Um, American brand influence number three can be felt globally. These are some of our brands globally on our power grid. Again, they're all squeezing up there on that upper right. Apple, Disney, Google, Starbucks, Tesla, Ben & Jerry's. You know, they're up there with BMW and Cirque du Soleil from Canada. And, you know, Again, impressive brands, some of the strongest in the world, and our American brands are influencing um, the rest of the world and the consumers in America today. Um, number four, standing for something and having influence does not mean being one dimensional. If Target was just about value, it would always be behind Walmart. But because Target's leaning into influence through value and style and making that mean something more together, that's power, that's tensity. That's what we look for. Americans appreciate it, the rest of the world appreciates it. Um, Lastly, branding is a national responsibility. America and the brands we create and, and push out around the world, I mean, they're tied together, right? So um, take advantage of it. Think about that as you think about how you do your branding around the world and how do you lean into America or not, depending on the scenario. Um, net, net harness brand America and, and find your influence. Hopefully um, that all made sense. And please reach out to me and I will talk if you want to talk further. Cheers. Have a good one.
Well, I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted now to be joined by uh, Dr. Stacey Graham, who is the uh, Global Racial Equity uh, Programs Director at WPP. Stacey, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this year we see um, social purpose becoming significantly important, um, which is a good thing. Um, why do you think that's so? I believe in the survey you define social purpose around a few categories, such as caring about gender and racial equity, uh, the environment, human rights, and so forth, right? And what we understand about humans is we have an innate desire to have a reason for being. That's another word for purpose. So I, I'd say if we look at what's happened in the world in the last two and a half, three years, that is definitely catapulted into the mainstream. We have all these things coming together that are pinpointing, illustrating how we're failing as a collective. Uh, and, and do you think that failure as a collective is something that's now being exposed right across the globe? Absolutely. I, I would say that even before 2020, we could see it happening. But there's something about a restriction of freedom of movement, right, that makes people sit at home and have nothing else to do but recognize and, and look into everything that's wrong with the world, if you will. And so I think that it's on people's minds. What does it mean to be in a collective when I'm sitting at home and can't leave my house anymore? What does it mean to really be connected as a society? How do we care for the most vulnerable? And to be really honest, with COVID-19, we didn't do a great job of that. So I think people are asking different questions than they were two to three years ago. And I think I found it quite interesting to, to see the relationship between this move, I mean, let's call it a movement, coming from the population upwards. I Absolutely. Suppose. I mean, we also see that some of our uh, health officials do move more politically than we would have expected. But there were people across the world who made the decision to wear a mask even when it was no longer mandated, who stayed at home even when they didn't want to, who got on the streets for probably the largest social movement since 1968, right? It was a global uh, social movement to bring awareness to racial inequality. So I think there's a coming together even in, in times of divisiveness. Now, one of the things we've seen in the study is this sort of interrelationship between a, a country's brand and companies' brands, and we're seeing that interrelationship even more sort of uh, mingled uh, and, uh, and prevalent uh, this year. So, so what should companies do to improve their social purpose in relation to how their country is seen? That is a great question. I think that is something that they're still figuring out. But one thing we know for sure is people aren't simply incentivized by money. That's not enough to keep employees today. Uh, employees want to work somewhere where they feel proud of not only the work that they do, but the things that the company stands for. They want to see their company standing up for social issues that they personally care about. Stacey, why do you think suddenly companies are finding a political voice as opposed to purely a corporate voice? I think to an extent, we have been able to observe this shift away. When I studied, there was a, a clear connection. The business strategy has to align with shareholder value. That's all we care about, maximizing shareholder value. And there was a notion that maximizing shareholder value stood in opposition to a social purpose, if you will. Mm -hmm. And today, I think people are recognizing that's actually not true. And we increase shareholder value when we can ensure that we have high employee engagement, low turnover, and people care about what they do in the company they work for. Well, Stacey Graham, that's a fantastic place uh, to stop. Um, we, this whole topic is uh, something that uh, we are all going to have to understand a lot better uh, and not just understand it, but also ensure that uh, it's actions as opposed to merely words. But for the moment, Dr. Stacey Graham, the Global Racial Equity Programs Director at WPP, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thank you. Hello and a very warm welcome. My name is David Roth and I'm the CEO of The Store WPP and Chairman of BAV. Thank you very much indeed for joining me in this very special Metaverse experience. 
exploring the WPP BAV Best Countries 2022 study in conjunction with Wharton Business School and US News. Here we are in the Arrivals Hall, where you'll be able to discover the key insights from this year's study relating to global trends. Here you'll also find exclusive interviews with global experts and analysis of the data. And, and what a year we've had. There have been a lot of changes from last year. From here, you can also go and visit the 85 countries that are ranked in this year's report. Each of those countries have their own individual room where you can explore a wealth of data and insights into each individual country. You might well see some surprises along your journey. And in the departure area, you can discover more about the study itself. Enjoy your trip around the BAV Best Countries 2022 Metaverse. Well, we're almost at the end of our broadcast. A big thanks to everybody from the local WPP companies who've participated. And of course, our central team that's put together all of our Follow the Sun 24 hours of broadcasting to our directors, to Indus Gupta, to Paul Reifer and our producers, Sarah Cousins and Lady Victoria Robinson. Well, all that's left for me, David Roth at WPP, to say thank you very much indeed for joining and the next broadcast Follow shortly on the hour. If you're done